Good evening, everyone. Good evening, church. It's a joy and privilege uh, to be with you this evening and to open God's uh, word with you. Um, yes, my name is John Menton. I'm originally, I was born in East London. I went to school here. And then I moved to the United States where I met my wife, Naomi. And we spent about 14 years there together. God blessed us with uh, three beautiful daughters. And then in 2014, um, after we had planted, been part of a church plant in, in Florida, in the United States, we uh, were sent by that church uh, to East London to start a work called Forever Mercy, uh, which seeks to provide uh, a family home for vulnerable and orphaned children. And so God, in his kindness and his goodness, has added six children to our family. And so um, at the moment, we have with eight children with us uh, in the home, and it's, it's a wonderful blessing. Would you open your Bibles uh, to Hebrews chapter 6? It's going to be in Hebrews chapter 6, and from verse 13 uh, to the end of the chapter. When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves and all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your word is truth, and that is what we desperately need for our lives. In this uncertain world, we can be sure of one thing, and that is your word. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would refresh, convict, comfort, and transform us with your truth. May we love Christ more deeply and serve Christ more wholeheartedly. We ask you this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Eighty-six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? These words are spoken by Polycarp as he was about to be martyred in 160 AD. Now Polycarp was a disciple of the apostle John and he was the bishop at the church in Smyrna. Polycarp, at 86 years old, he was considered an enemy of the Roman Empire. Caesar had hunted him down and had him arrested. And so the day came for his martyrdom. The governor urged him, swear, reproach Christ, and I will set you free. Polycarp was then threatened with wild animals, with fire and with sword, to which he replied, why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. It is unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. Now for these early Christians, following Christ was not easy. It came with great cost. And this was certainly true for the Christians to whom this book, the book of Hebrews, was written roughly 90 years earlier. The author of the book of Hebrews, he's a pastor, and he's deeply concerned for this church. Now the church is mostly made up of Jews who had heard the good news of Jesus, who had made a profession of faith in him, but were now seriously thinking of giving up and going back to a Christless Judaism. 
In chapter 10, we find out that some in this church community were facing real hardship because of their allegiance to Christ. Some were publicly shamed and rejected by their families. Some lost all their possessions. They were imprisoned because of their, their association with Jesus and his church. For some of them, this cost seemed far too great. Now, perhaps you have felt this way before. Of the pressures of this life and this world and the attractiveness of sin ever caused you to consider turning your back on Jesus. The author, their pastor, he received news about his church, and out of his love, out of his concern for them, he writes to them. Now, Hebrews is essentially one long sermon containing words of warning and encouragement to remain faithful and to endure to the end. The first part of chapter 6 contains one of the most severe warning passages in all of Scripture. The author makes a clear and powerful warning. There is no hope outside of Christ. Turn your back on Christ, and that will lead to destruction. And yet we see that this pastor, he doesn't want these believers to stay in a place of questioning their faith. He desires to encourage, not discourage, to give reason for hope, not for doubt. And so in verse 11 of chapter 6, we see that he wants each one of them to have full assurance of hope. And he wants them and us to have this hope until the end. The end. Yes, there's going to come a day when hope won't be needed anymore because hope will be fully realized. Faith will become sight. But until that day, we must have this hope. Why? So that we will continue trusting and serving the Lord until the very end. Look with me at verse 12. So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. How is this possible? How do we inherit the promises? This brings us to our text for this morning. And what the author and the Holy Spirit wants us to know, sorry, this evening, <laughs> so used to preaching in the morning, is that God's people have great encouragement to hold fast to hope as they patiently wait for God's promises. God's people have great encouragement to hold fast to hope as they patiently wait for God's promises. The first thing that we're going to see in this text is God's promises are guaranteed. God's promises are guaranteed, and they are guaranteed by his character. Do you trust God's promises? This is the very foundation of what it means to be a Christian, that by grace through faith we trust in Christ, the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation. This is the gospel, the good news. And we never move on from this. We, we never graduate from this. But we are supposed to mature, to grow in our understanding of what it means to trust in God. To help us to do this, the author takes us way back to the book of Genesis, to a scene in the life of a man named Abraham. Look with me again at verse 13. When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abram, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. So you know the story of Abraham, right? Abraham, he, he's this guy who God called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, he's an idol worshiper. He, he's, he's not a godly man. And, and all the nations are around are fraught, right? They're Every one of them are bad. And so God says to Abraham, I'm going to make my own nation. I'm going to start with you. And we read this in Genesis 12. And God calls him out from this land and he says, let's go. I will give you a land of spring and blessing. I'm going to give you a land where I will protect you and provide for you. I'm going to give you offspring. Now the problem is you're going to have a barren wife 
And so that's, that's going to have to be a miracle. And then I'm going to bless you, and through one of your offspring, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so Abraham waits 25 years, and then finally he gets that promised son, Isaac. And then God asks him to do the unthinkable. In Genesis 22, God tells him, you know that son, that son that you waited 25 years for, the one through whom this nation is, is supposed to come, I want you to take him up Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him up as a burnt offering. And Abraham, by faith, takes Isaac up that mountain. He, he tells the guys who are with him, my son and I will be back. He doesn't know how it's going to work out, but he knew God had been faithful so far, so they went up. And Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham knew that God could even raise Isaac from the dead if he needed to. So Abraham lay Isaac on the altar. He drew back the knife to kill his son, his only son, in obedience to God. And God says, stop, wait. He said, now I see that you trust me. And then we read in Genesis 22:15. An angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand is on the seashore. God swore and made a promise. He makes a promise to Abraham and swears by himself that he would keep it. Now, in our passage this morning, the author explains the meaning of this. In verse 13, we see, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And then if we look at verse 16, For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So let me ask you, why do people swear? I'm not talking about cussing, saying bad words, making promise. I I swear to do this. The reason that someone would swear would be to confirm their word. And when people swear, they swear by something greater than themselves. Uh, You've heard people do it. Perhaps you've done it. I I swear to God, I'm telling you the truth. Now, I was called once as a witness in court, and I had to swear before the judge. I, I will tell the truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. When we make an oath like this, we are, what we are essentially doing is appealing to someone or something greater than us to show how serious we are about keeping our promise. But when you're God, you've got a problem, right? <laughs> Who are you going to swear by? You are the greatest. You are it. So what do you do? You swear by yourself, and that's what God does. He swore by his own name, meaning I will cease to be God if I break this promise. It's the same thing God did in Genesis 15 when God confirmed the promises he had made to Abraham in a covenant ceremony. He has Abraham go and get the animals, and then Abraham splits the animals apart into two halves. And back then, this would normally happen when when covenants were made. Two parties would walk through the middle of the cut animals. And as they made a contract, and what they would be saying is, if I break this covenant, if I break this contract, if I break my part, this will happen to me. I'm going to get sawn in two. And yet... Abraham doesn't go through. God says, good night. Adam falls asleep. Abraham falls asleep. And while Abraham is sleeping, God walks through the middle of the animals by himself. Why? Because God's faithfulness to this covenant is not going to rest on Abraham. It's on God himself. He says, I'm going to die. I'm going to stop being God if I break this promise. God guarantees his promise 
with an oath. Now, why did God swear by his own name? He doesn't need to, right? Surely God's word is enough. He is God after all. I mean, as people, we do it all the time because we lie. But God doesn't lie. So why does God do it? He does it to give us confidence in his promises. Look at verse 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise. Now, let's just stop for one second. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about Abraham and everyone who are children of Abraham through faith. Now, this includes you and me if we have turned from our sin and we've trusted in the Lord Jesus. And what does he desire to show us? We look at verse 18. The unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie. So that we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. God swore by his own name so that we would have strong encouragement to trust his promises We can be sure that he will not break his word because we know that it is impossible for God to lie. God never changes his mind. He doesn't make false promises. He will never betray you. When God says he will do something, it will be done. God's promises are guaranteed by who he is, by his character. Now, church, We have to know this. We have to believe this. We have to keep reminding ourselves of this because we all struggle, don't we? We all struggle to trust. Our tendency is to look everywhere else for hope and for security. But the problem is that everything else will ultimately fail us. It just does. The government, our jobs, money, car, our health, everything in this life will ultimately fail. And all that sin offers us, all of the escapes that it promises that are out there for us. In the moment, yes, sin may taste sweet, but it turns bitter. Everything in this world will ultimately fail you. But God's character is unchangeable and his purposes are perfect. Now, what does this mean for us? It means we can bank everything, our whole lives on what? He has promised. It gives us strong encouragement to hold fast to our hope in his word. Let me ask you, what are you resting your life upon this evening? Is it upon something that is certain or are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in someone or something else that will ultimately fail you? Right now, God in his mercy is reminding you that he's the only unchanging, forever faithful one, and that whatever he has set before you is best, and he is calling you to flee to him for refuge. Have you ever fled to something for refuge before? When we were in Florida, we experienced quite a few hurricanes, and these destructive storms, they they would make their way up the Atlantic Ocean, Thank you, Africa. And we, everyone would prepare for the worst. We would board up our, our windows, board up our homes. Sometimes we would have to leave town. We were fleeing because something very dangerous was about to come. We were seeking refuge from a great storm. But there's a greater storm fast approaching that is far worse than any hurricane, far worse than any tsunami. And that is God's wrath for sin. But God, in his great mercy, has provided a place of refuge to flee to by faith. A place where you can find forgiveness in Christ no matter what you have done, where you've been. A place where you can be reconciled with God and where the righteousness of Christ will shield you on that day. If you are a Christian, that is where you have gone. You have fled for refuge to Christ, and he wants to reassure you 
That's exactly where you need to rest and put your hope. We have strong encouragement. We have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. Great encouragement. It's not a friendly pat on the back to cheer you up on the way to glory. No. It strengthens us. It gives courage. It fills us with unwavering confidence because we know that God has perfect eternal purposes and he's working out. And because of who he is, he will bring these promises to pass. That's just what he does. And so we are to hold fast. We are to seize. We are to grasp the hope set before us by faith. And we know that this hope is ultimately Jesus himself. Hope to see him, hope to be with him, and to trust him every step of the way until we get there. That's the hope that the author says is set before us. And that word set, it's the same word that the, the author uses in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where he says, For the joy that was set before Jesus, the joy that was set before Jesus that moved Jesus to persevere through the shame of the cross. Jesus was certain that he would be with the Father on the other side of the cross, that he would share in the glory that they had together before the foundation of the world, so that he would bring his bride, the church, with him. The joy that was set before him, that's what moved Jesus to persevere, and that's what should motivate us to persevere. You are called to have that same certainty based on God's promise, strongly encouraged by God's covenant. And that helps you to know that in sickness, in suffering, in trials, will not ultimately consume you. And that sin that seems difficult to tear out from your life, it will not ultimately overtake you. The sorrow that seems to hang upon you like a cloud it will not ultimately overwhelm you if you are in Christ. There is set before us a promise of glory which the Father has sworn with an oath, which the Son has sealed with his blood, and which the Spirit is empowering us to hold fast to by faith until it is accomplished. God is saying this evening, it is worth trusting me. It's worth trusting me all the way to glory. I will keep my promise you do not need to fear. And this is what is set before Christians, the hope of being with Jesus there. Revelation 21 tells us that it is a place where there'll be no more tears, no death, no sorrow, no more sin. It's just gone. Because Christ has destroyed our enemies fully and finally. Jesus is our refuge. Jesus is our hope. But between then and now, we also need to know that God's people are called to wait. God's people are called to patiently wait. And that's our second point this evening. God's people patiently wait. Verse 15. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. God's promises are true. His oath is certain. His character is unchanging. But God's people don't usually inherit what God promised immediately. They follow the example of Abraham. Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. He patiently waited. Patient waiting is always the posture of God's people. We are a waiting people. There's always something that we are waiting for God to do. Some things we expect to see soon, some things we expect to see further down the road, and others not until we go to be with him. God always has his people waiting, watching, waiting, watching for his hand to deliver faithfully what he has promised. Have you ever thought about how long the fathers in Genesis were called to wait to receive just a portion of their promises. Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac. Isaac waited 20 years for Jacob and Esau. 
Jacob waited 20 years for his freedom from Laban before he was able to go home to his land. And Joseph waited 22 years before God brought his plans to pass. That's a lot of waiting. God always calls his people to patiently wait. Because you see, there is something that is proven about God through the waiting. That he is worth waiting for. That he is worth it. Because the temptation of sin is for you to believe that there's something else worth trading God for. There's some promise out there that's going to be a a little better and a lot quicker. Because God often seems so slow to us, doesn't he? But God makes us wait intentionally. Why? Because it teaches us not to rest on what he can do for us, but to rest upon him. Psalm 119.68 says, so that we would know that he is good and he does good. Now, sometimes the waiting's short, other times it's very long. Hebrews 11.13, speaking of Abraham, Sarah, and others, says, These all died in faith, having not received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that there were strangers and exiles on the earth. So they saw some things fulfilled, but not everything. Yet they looked ahead with eyes of faith. They pressed on. They were fueled by the truth that God doesn't lie. And it changed the way they lived on earth because they knew this world was not their home. And so they warred. They they fought against impatience. And we've got to do the same. It says we need to be imitators of those who faith of those who through faith and patience, like Abraham, who trusted God all the way to the end. Now what's amazing about this is when you read Hebrews eleven and you you see the hall of faith, they're just a bunch of messed up people. They really are. Just just like us. Abraham, Moses, Samson, David. They all messed up. They all fell short. So we see that This pilgrimage that we are on is not so much about perfection, but it's more about direction. See, they fell back up. They fell, but they got back up. They went the wrong way, but they turned back. But I think it's important for us to note the sin in Abraham's life, because the author has given us him as an example here in the text. So when we see Abraham straying, What do we see that's weak in him? It's faith and it's patience. These are two things that, ironically, that the father of faith was the weakest in. Now think about it with me. Hey, Sarah, we're going down to Egypt and nobody fears God down there. So how about you say that you're my sister? Let's come up with our own plan to protect ourselves rather than trusting God's promise that he'll make us a great nation. We see that faith was weak. How about this? Hey, let's have a baby with Hagar instead of waiting for the promised child through Sarah. I mean, come on. I've been waiting for 12 years. I've been praying a long time. We see again, patience is weak. You see, it's when we are called to wait on God that Satan sees an easy opportunity. You can be sure of this. Satan will always provide a false savior, an idol that will show up on your timetable. Satan will always provide a false savior, an idol that will show up on your timetable. That's how he often got to Israel, isn't it? Verse uh, We see this in Exodus 32. Moses, he's he's been up the the mountain with God. The people get all antsy. Moses, we we don't know what's become of him. They go to Aaron. Hey, Aaron, make us a God that we can see. So Aaron said to them, bring your gold. I'll make you a God, a God that will show up when you want him. Listen, Satan isn't original. He's been doing the same thing since the garden. And so we need to be very careful as we wait upon God to fulfill his promises because our faith, our patience will be tested. 
This is true of us from birth. Now, if you have children, uh, if you've been around children, you know this to be true. You can teach a child a, a lot of stuff, but you don't need to teach them impatience. Now, if you want to see this in action, come over to our house at mealtime, uh, and you, you will see it in, in full force. But you know what amazes me is that we don't actually change all that much, do we? When it comes to impatience, I think we're all just really a bunch of sophisticated toddlers. Impatience doesn't die easily because we live in a culture that cultivates impatience and discontentment. Everything in our culture is about immediate gratification. Get what you want when you want it. Many of us are in debt because we have no self-control to delay instant gratification. We, we can't wait. We've got to have it. So we buy stuff with money that we don't have. And life in this world is all about speed and efficiency. Microwaves, drive through restaurants. We have instant messaging. We can watch an entire TV series just in one go not on Netflix. So we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for anything. We complain when the internet is too slow. We hate waiting in lines anywhere. But what about when, uh, and even like, uh, especially back in the day when you had to call telecom or if you had to make a phone call to BCM and you hear that, that dreaded sound uh, on the automated response, your whole time is <laughs> five minutes. What do we do? We hang up. But what about when God says your whole time is approximately 25 years? That's when it starts to set in, doesn't it? Anger, frustration, bitterness, moaning, complaining, because we've been trained that we should get what we want when we want it and how we want it. So unbelief shows itself in our impatience, and it shows itself in all sorts of ways. How does impatience show itself in you? How does that affect your walk with Jesus? Fear, anxiety, sin. You see, we, we want heaven now and we, and we want it on our terms. We wouldn't admit this, but it, it sure seems like sometimes we treat God like some sort of cosmic butler that we ring and we expect him to serve us. But he's not like that. And so we become discontent. We become depressed and we despair, waiting up upon God. We don't have time for that. So please hear this. We have to trust that any waiting that God calls us to do is for our good. It's better than him giving you what you thought is best. Waiting is often evidence of God's love for you. You want proof of that? We look in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. How are you counting? He goes on. But his patience toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So we complain. God, why, do, why don't you do something about all the evil, all the suffering in the world? How many of you are grateful that God didn't do something about it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20? You see, God is patient on purpose, and he wants us to be patient and trust him day by day. So his promises are set before us, and what we need to do is rest, trusting that he is good, and all that he does is good. He's made a promise He's sworn it upon his character. He's given us his son. Romans 8.32. So how much more should we trust that he will give us all things? Matthew 7.11. And that if we who are evil know how to give good gifts, how much more should we trust that when we ask our good father for bread, he won't give us a stone? You see, he may not give you what you want, but he won't give you a stone because he knows what you need. He knows because he's God. And so he calls us to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And because that's hard and we often waver, we need help. 
We need someone to be steady because we are not, which is the third and final point this evening. God's priest is the anchor for our souls. God's priest is the anchor for our souls. Look, look at verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The author moves now from the example of Abraham to the image of an anchor. Do any of you have, have boats or you've been around boats? I'm not um, very familiar with sailing, but I think we all know one thing is that if you don't have an anchor, you're in big trouble. You need an anchor. Because what it does is it keeps you from drifting if there's a strong wind or current. The anchor is, is thrown overboard and it digs into the sand below and it holds the boat in place. It keeps you from shipwreck. That's what an anchor does. And the author uses this image to describe the Christian's hope. You see, we need hope to remain steadfast in the storms of suffering. We need hope to remain steadfast when the winds of false teaching come to carry us away. We need hope when waves of doubt and despair crash against the whole of our hearts. We need something, someone that is holding us fast. We need a sure and steadfast anchor. Now, our hope here is not described as mere optimism. You know, that kind of brighter days are, are just around the corner. It's all going to work out in the end. It's not some kind of positive feeling that you have. This too shall pass. No, our hope is much more secure than that. Our hope is trustworthy, immo immovable, secure, reliable. Why? Because of what our hope is. Do you notice that there's something different about this anchor? This anchor doesn't go down and connect you to the world. Rather, this anchor connects to Jesus in heaven, and it locks us in and secures us there. He says our hope is fastened to Christ himself. Our hope is in Christ himself. He is the one that the Father promised and has sworn that will forever serve as our high priest. This is the hope that is set before us. It's him. It's not just a, a feeling. It's something very, very real. It's the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is our hope. And all that he has done for us is our hope. Because he has done everything that we have failed to do. And he has entered into the inner place behind the curtain. Now this brings to mind the Holy of Holies. The place in the temple where God's presence would be. The curtain or veil is a reminder that people are separated from God. No one could go in there except the high priest, and he would go once a year to bring the blood, to, uh, the blood offering for sins. But here we see that Jesus has gone in behind the curtain. On the cross, when Jesus died, when he said, it is finished, and the curtain was torn from top to bottom, sinners can now enter in. Jesus has gone on before us as a forerunner. He has gone to where we ultimately want to be, and he will be faithful to bring us there. If you are a Christian this evening, we know that what, it, what that means is that you have recognized that you were born a rebel against God, that your entire life was spent trying to have some kind of form of heaven here on earth. Whatever way you could get it, trusting in whatever th you thought you, that would make that happen. But God, in his mercy and grace, sought you out. And by his Holy Spirit, he opened your eyes to see the truth of the gospel. That Jesus is the only one who actually brings us to heaven. Heaven is not a place on earth. It is with him. And so in repentance... You have turned away from your sin and living for yourself. And now by faith you follow and worship Jesus, the one who died on the cross for your sins, who received the judgment you rightly deserved, 
who rose from the grave and has gone to the place where you want to be. But notice it also says something else in verse 20. It says, Jesus is ministering there on our behalf, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. He is the great and eternal high priest who intercedes for us. Church, do you know this? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and he's ministering on your behalf. He's praying for you. Hebrews 4.14 says that he is your high priest who sympathizes with your weaknesses. He sympathizes with your weaknesses. He knows all the unique things that constantly threaten your voyage to glory. He knows what causes you to be impatient. He knows all your temptations. He knows your besetting sins. He knows your doubts. He knows about the loneliness you feel after losing a spouse, a sister, a brother, or a good friend. He knows how difficult it has been for you to care for your aging parents. He knows how long you've been struggling with your health. He knows how long you've been waiting for a job. He knows how long you've been waiting for a spouse. He knows how long you've been waiting for your children to come to the Lord. He knows about your broken family. He knows. He knows. He knows it all. And what he calls us to do by faith is to know and believe that that all these things that we go through, though they hurt us, they are not aimed to ultimately harm us. They are aimed to remind us that we need Jesus and remind us that this world is not our home. In this world, we will have trouble, and Satan desires to undermine our faith. He desires to erode our faith, to erode our confidence, to rob us of our hope. The truth of God's word we see in the world today is being attacked from all sides even by professing those who profess to be believers. We are told that truth is relative, that morality is subjective. Saints, we will be mocked, we will be ridiculed for believing everything in this ancient book. What it says about creation, what it says about marriage and sexuality, what it says about men and women, what it says about sin and salvation, what it says about final judgment and eternity. So like Polycarp and these early Jewish believers, we are in some way all being urged to offer incense to Caesar, to bow to the gods of this age. And so there is one last thing in verse 20 that I want you to see. It says, Jesus is the high priest forever after the order of of Melchizedek. Now, there's not enough time to unpack all that that means. Uh, the whole of chapter 7 is really devoted to this, but it's very important. So quickly, we're just going to look at this. What is, who is Mel- Melchizedek? Uh, he's this mysterious character. He shows up to meet Abraham in Genesis 14. Basically, he's a priest and he is a king. He's a king of righteousness and of peace. He's without father and mother. He has no genealogy. He's no beginning, he's no end. So what does this mean in this context? Saying, the author is saying here, Jesus is not only priest, he's not only savior, he is king, he is Lord. Jesus is reigning and ruling until all things are under his control and everything will be put in subjection under his feet. Satan, sin, death, they're all going to be destroyed. So despite what we see around us, that is the reality. Despite what we see in the world, what's going on, this is the reality, that Jesus is king. And so at the end of this book that I've been reading about Polycarp, uh, there are two lines that stood out to me, and we see the source of his courage. The first thing I saw is that he calls his day of martyrdom a day of victory. He calls his day of martyrdom a day of victory. And second, it says this. It says, Polycarp was arrested by Herod when Philip was high priest, 
and Statius Quadratus was governor, but while Jesus Christ was reigning as king forever. While Jesus Christ was reigning as king forever. See, Polycarp knew that, that Rome and Caesar, those are just the shadows. But the reality is Jesus Christ. He is Lord of this universe. And so church, where do we look for hope? Hope that will give us courage to keep on trusting, to keep on serving, no matter the cost. What will sustain the church? What will fuel our faithfulness to God's word and the proclamation of the gospel in this world? God is calling us this evening to look to Christ with full assurance of hope. Jesus, our high priest, our king, who is in heaven, and God has promised, God has promised, he has swore it, he has sealed it with an oath, that all who trust in him will be there with him on that day. We're almost there. We're almost there. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for your word. Your word that is sure, that is true, that is trustworthy. Father, we pray that you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, that you would cause us to let go of all false hopes and to hold fast to the sure and steady hope. Jesus, the anchor of our souls. 